All right, and we should be recording. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, afternoon uh, entertainment, so to speak, the uh, 11th episode in our webinar series that we've uh, named Cell Biology Scandinavia. Uh, the title of today's event will be How to Fit In, Mechanics of Cell Integration in Vivo. Uh, what we will present today, together with our guest, uh, Jakub Sedinski, is a lecture on this topic. We're very excited to host you. So, my name is Daniel. I work at Milmed Tech, uh, and I will start off this event by giving you a short introduction uh, to how everything works here. After that, it will be uh, followed by Krista Rantanen, Director of Scientific Applications at Baker. And then, of course, the main event by uh, Jakub Sedinski will be the lecture that we're all looking forward to. This will be followed by live Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, at the end of the lecture, we will uh, uh, change how this entire webinar is built up and we will turn it into a meeting. There you can uh, turn on your cameras and microphones and ask uh, Jakub any questions live, should you wish to do so. But we also have the option of asking questions uh, in a written format. All right, so Milmed Tech, uh, who are we? Well, we can find us in Sweden and Norway. Uh, we do, uh, act as a distributor to uh, several leading brands in lab tech, med tech, and in industrial technologies. Uh, and our slogan is tailored laboratory and industry technologies. One of the people we work with is, of course, uh, Baker. Uh, I wanted to use this uh, moment to uh, present one of uh, the systems that we sell and provide services to. And that would be the in vivo series of hypoxia workstations from Baker. Uh, I always want people to ask themselves if a deviation from physiological conditions could affect their results. And then specifically with the focus on the physiological oxygen concentrations, because not many people consider this in cell culture. The in vivo series is uh, what I like to call a glove box meets incubator. It's a completely closed system that allows uh, control uh, of oxygen, CO2, relative humidity and temperature for the perfect environment to culture your cells. You can also culture cells at physiological oxygen, hypoxia, whatever you'd like. So if you're in Sweden and Norway, please let me know if this is of interest to you. Uh, and of course, if you want to work uh, outside of Scandinavia, we can always contact Baker. And if you want, I can mediate the contact there. I also want to give a shout out to our upcoming event, uh, which is uh, episode 12 with a undecided title so far but we've arranged uh, to work together with uh, Louina Arends uh, at the, the Arctic University of Norway. Um, that will be in September, so we're taking a summer break before that, but just so you can keep that in your calendar, should you wish. Right, with that, I will hand over the reins to our co-host, Krista Rantanen at Baker, who will give a lecture on her slides as well. Yes, thank you, Daria. Not quite a lecture, um, just <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of topics that I want to um, run by you. Uh, like Daria said, I'm the science director here at Baker, also a visiting scientist at the Francis Crick Institute in London, uh, working with hypoxia, so that's, that's pretty neat. But for Baker, of course, um, just want to introduce Baker. Next slide, please. Uh, Baker has been uh, around quite a long time, so uh, 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 being specialized in biological safety cabinets since the 70s. In fact, that's, that was their innovation. Um, then the Ruskin bit, which developed the hypoxia workstations in, in the late 90, uh, 1990s. And then, um, then Baker in US started in the 40s with the biological safety cabinet. So you can see they, they've been around quite a long time and have the know-how uh, how to do these things. However, we have evolved with the world, next slide please, and become just 
Baker. So no more Baker Ruskin or Clean Air by Baker, which is under one umbrella name called Baker, which will now be the biological safety cabinets and, and, and low oxygen workstations, etc. So that is the first bit. Another thing that I want to introduce is Hyparx EU. Hyparx EU is a science for science um, series of events. Usually they are webinars, uh, but we do have live events also. We had one in September in Dublin, and we are going to host the next one in 2024 May in the beautiful city of Dresden. Now, Hyparx EU, like I said, is a scientific event. It supports science, science and especially young scientists. And we do this by having this excellent scientific a committee that you can see in the next slide. Uh, maybe some of the names are quite well known to you also. So we, we do have the support of the uh, of the greatest in the field, so, so to speak. Um, next slide, please. So like I said, we do online quarterly seminars. Uh, we want to encourage um, the networking and communication between scientists globally, and not only in, in Europe, but globally. Um, especially focusing on supporting younger scientists and give them the possibility to present their data to their, to their peer groups. And um, um, next one, yes, so here you can see how to get a hold of us and how to find more information. Uh, like I said, next live event will be in Dresden next year, so you can uh, find information through hyparxeu.com. So having said this, this is my bit, and I just want to hand over to Jakub, and let's hear about uh, his lecture. So thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Daniel and Krista, for the invitation. A pleasure to be part of this uh, seminar series. <clears throat> so what I will just start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, so thanks a lot, thanks a lot again. <clears throat> yes, uh, again, a uh, great pleasure to be part of this seminar series. Really happy to do so. Uh, if there are some problems, technical problems, please let me know. So today I would like to talk about our recent work, which is about mechanics of cell integration in vivo in a context of developing mucociliary epithelium. So what is this mucociliary epithelium? So mucociliary epithelium is specialized tissue that uh, lines our respiratory tract it consists of multiple cell types which are schematically re schematically represented in here <clears throat> so we have uh, different cell types for example including goblet cells so goblet cells produce produce mucus so mucus mucus is very viscous substance that traps bacteria dust particles pretty much everything what we're breathing in then we have ionocytes. Ionocytes actually regulate viscosity of the mucus, and they're doing so by regulating the concentration of ions between the membrane. Then we have basal stem cells. So these cells, in principle, can regenerate other cell types, for example, upon injury of the mucociliary epithelium. And, and finally, we have these funny-looking cells called multiciated cells, which are decorated by hundreds of these uh, uh, hair-like protrusions called cilia, which are kind of sticking out of the apical domain of the cell, and the cilia are actually beating in a synchronized way, and by doing so, they move mucus along the epithelium. So all of these cell types are, <clears throat> are working perfectly uh, together. They are perfectly synchronized. They are perfectly um, balanced, as you can, for example, appreciate on this movie. So, so now we're looking at the, at the mucociliary epithelium in the mice trachea. So you can see very nicely the flow of the mucus from left to the right. And again, uh, this mucus is transported uh, as a consequence of the ciliary beating uh, of, 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 of these multiciated cells. So interestingly, multiciated cells are also present in other parts of our body. So for example, uh, they're present in brain where they move cerebrospinal fluid and also in the female oviduct when they, where they move over towards the uterus. So in all of these cases, they basically function to move the fluid uh, in, a, in a unidirectional uh, manner. 
So in our lab, we are particularly interested in understanding the development of these multi-seated cells. So what do we know about these multi-seated cells? So we know that <clears throat> multi-seated cells originate from these basally positioned progenitor cells. So this uh, basally positioned progenitor cells upon specification, they will migrate from the inner towards the outer layer of the epithelium, where they will integrate with the rest of the cells by, a, by expanding the apical domain. So you can see here that the cell goes from the bottom, inserts into the superficial layer, into these goblet cells, and expand the apical domain. As a consequence, the cilia are growing from the apical side, and then at the end, we have fully functional uh, multi seated cell. So now the sequence of steps from this movement, so apical movement towards the apical side, so this as, uh, ascending movement of the, of the cell, and then insertion and expansion of the apical domain, all of these steps we cumulat cumulatively uh, call as radial intercalation. So in the lab, in order to study uh, the processes related to radial intercalation, we use model system. Specifically, we use frog embryonic epidermis. And the reason why we're using frog embryonic epidermis is very simple. So frog embryonic epidermis is also mucociliated, meaning that it consists of um, uh, mucus produ producing goblet cells and also multi seated cells. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, the species that we're working with. So this is Xenopus levis. On the right-hand side, we see an example of an embryo. It's quite a big embryo, one millimeter in diameter. And you can see all of these blue spots. And each of these blue spots actually represents a single uh, multi seated cell that you can appreciate on this scanning electron microscopy picture. So again, you can see very nicely these tufts of multi seated cells sticking out of the epithelium. And you can actually see also this uh, granules of mucus surrounding, um, surrounding multi seated cells. The big advantage of the, of the Xenopus uh, mucociliary epithelium is that it is positioned externally. So, so it's very easy to image processes related to radial intercalation, including the migration, including the expansion of the apical domain. All right. So, <clears throat> what we know based on our previous work is that the multi seated cell progenitor, as it migrates, it inserts into the superficial layer at the position called tricellular junction. So, in here, the tricellular junction is a vertex which is built by three or higher number of cells. So, again, upon insertion, the apical domain of the multi seated cell progenitor will expand, and then as a consequence, it will generate a space for the cilia to grow. And at the end, will generate fully functional multi seated cell. And this is how, to, how it actually looks in, in, in real life. So, now we're looking at the dynamics of apical domain expansion. So, in green, we see dynamics of actin specifically expressed in multi seated cells, and we can do this specific expression in multi seated cells using promoter called alpha tubulin promoter. In the middle, we see dynamics of actin in the neighboring goblet cells. And we can also express specifically uh, different constructs in these goblet cells using nectin promoter. So again, alpha tubulin promoter is specific for multi seated cells, and nectin promoter is specific for, for uh, goblet cells. But now, if we zoom out and look at the kind of bigger chunk of the tissue, we will see that in the tissue, in this mucociliary epithelium, we have actually hundreds of this mucociliary, uh, <clears throat> hundreds of this uh, multi-seated cell progenitors here in green that are migrating from the bottom towards the superficial layer. And we also, we also have hundreds of these uh, vertices, which poses the question, how this multi-seated cell progenitors actually select vertices? So how do they know, okay, that, uh, that they have to insert in this particular vertex? You know, is it as simple as, you know, first come, first serve? Or maybe there's a competition between cells, or maybe there is yet another uh, mechanism that, that is unknown. So this is exactly the question that, that we wanted to address with this, with this uh, project. So how do cells select vertices? Or in a way, <clears throat> maybe speaking more generally, how do cells perceive the three-dimensional uh, tissue environment? So we started addressing this question, looking at the looking at the dynamics of this uh, radially intercalating multi seated cell progenitors. So what we did in here, we label again uh, actin in the multi seated cell progenitors right after it gets uh, specified. So in the very beginning of the of the radial intercalation process. Uh, so here again, in green, we see multi seated cell, and then in magenta, we see uh, outlines of the surrounding goblet cells. 
So the very first thing we notice is that as this multi-theated cell progenitors migrate towards the superficial uh, layer, they are making these long protrusions called philopodia. So these are the actin-rich protrusions. You can think about these protrusions as kind of like a fingers that are probing the environment. So that was very interesting. And we thought, okay, are those philopodia are, you know, are they directly targeting vertices in which they're intercalate or maybe they're random? So to answer this question, we decided to quantify uh, dynamics of the philopodia. So let me tell you how we do so. So what we do, we basically re-slice this three-dimensional movie, as you can see here, along the vertical axis, which will give us this kind of 2D projection, where we can still very nicely see the dynamics of the philopodia. So we can see how philopodia are probing the, the environment. You can actually see also the position of the vertices. So these are the high concentration spots of actin. What we do next, we basically outline the leading edge of the cell. So what we do in here, we plot intensity profile of actin. So going from the left towards the right, so all along the uh, leading edge of the cell. And by doing so, we get something what we call a cortex profile. Yeah. Then in the next step, what we do, we move this uh, region above the cortical region of the cell. So this is the region where the philopodia are present. And we do basically the same. So we basically uh, plot intensity of actin in this region from the, from the left towards the right, all along the, um, the selected uh, region. Then what we do, and I simplified in here, we normalize these two intensity profiles, one versus the other. And then at the end, we got something what we call philo philopodia index profile. So this is represented by the two colors. So the cyan color represents the position along the leading edge of the cell. And the magenta color represents the position where philopodia are present. So if you do such a quantification for, for an example, for one of this uh, uh, intercalating cell, you get uh, result as on as as shown on the right hand side. So there's a lot of information on this plot. So let me just walk you through. Uh, so on the x-axis we have position uh, along the along the leading edge of the cell. So basically it tells you how the leading edge of the cell is moving kind of horizontally in respect to the to the to the environment to the 3D environment. And on the y-axis we have time. Then in addition we also mark the position of the left and the right tricellular junctions. So these are the left one and the right. So these are the two vertices which are uh, overlying the position of the, of the intercalating cell. And these uh, vertices are also color coded as to the distance between the top of the leading, the top of the leading edge of the cell towards the left and the right uh, tricellular junction. Again, there's a lot of information here, but what is interesting is, is that S cell radially intercalate, we see that the philopodia are underlying the vertices. So you can see here that initially the philopodia are kind of probing the left vertex, and then later on uh, the philopodia are kind of underneath both of the vertices, so left and right, and the situation kind of continues uh, throughout the uh, rest of the radial intercalation process. So this is very interesting, but it still doesn't really answer the question, okay, are this philopodia, you know, directly interacting with the with the vertices, or they are just pointing towards these vertices. So to answer this question, we uh, decided to express the the structural component of the tricellular junction, which is LSR, which stands for lipolysis stimulated lipoprotein receptor. So this is bas basically the central sealing element, like a rod that uh, seals the, the vertex, so the tricellular junction, so basically points down into the epithelium. So now if you look at the localization of LSR in our system, it localizes as it should, so towards the vertices, towards the tricellular junctions. And if you look at the orthogonal projection, we see that kind of resembles these cable-like structures that hangs down into the, uh, into the epithelium. So what we did next, we visualize again uh, dynamics of radially intercalating multi cells using uh, actin marker expressed with this MCC, so multi cell specific alpha tubulin promoter. And we also visualize dynamics of these LSR cables specifically expressed in the superficial goblet cells. So this is what we get. So you can see here that as the 
multi-seeded cell progenitors migrate towards the superficial layer, they're kind of targeting the cables, these LSR cables using the filopody. So you can appreciate it better looking at the still images. So on the left corner or the left uh, column, we see the 2D projection, kind of unfast projection. In the middle, we see the 3D representation, but I think maybe the best if you look at the, at the separate channels. So uh, we see here in magenta on the top, we see in magenta uh, LSR specific signal. So this is LSR specific to the goblet cells, to the superficial layer. And in green, we see the signal from the filopodium. And then if we, if we now uh, separate this, uh, this signal into two separate channels, so here LSR in this uh, fire-like colors and actin corresponding to the, to the filopodia in this gray color, is very easy to distinguish or to see that indeed the filopodia are directly uh, interacting with the, uh, with the LSR cable uh, hanging down from the, from the tricellular junctions of the superficial layer. However, what is also very interesting that LSR is not only expressed in the superficial layer, but it's also expressed in the filopodium. So if you look now at the dynamics of the single filopodium, which is shown in here, and again, uh, here the filopodium will be uh, visualized with magenta color, looking again at actin, and LSR is visualized here in the cyan color, we see here that as filopodium is expanding and retracting, LSR is kind of decorating the, the tip of the, of the filopodium. And you can see it uh, better when we look at the still images. So again, as, as, uh, as filopodium is expanding, the LSR signal is at the tip of the filopodium, and then as, filop as the filopodium is retracting, uh, the LSR is also present there. So this is also kind of interesting because it would suggest that these interactions between uh, multiseated cells, so filopodia uh, coming from the multiseated cell and LSR from the, um, from the uh, tricellular junctions could be happening through these homophilic interactions between LSR and LSR. So now the very obvious thing would be to, to ask the question, okay, so what will happen if we then uh, knock down LSR specifically in multiseated cells? Yeah, and this is what we did in here using uh, what we called mosaic knockdown, meaning that in our tissue, some of the cells, some of these multiseated cells will be controlled, so will be wild type, and some of the cells will be depleted of the uh, LSR. So let's have a look. So you can see here, as I play this movie, that the cells that are expressing our green signal, so this is again actin, these are the wild type multiseated cells. So these cells radially intercalate from the bottom, they insert into the vertices and they expand the apical domain. So this is a normal, um, kind of uh, control uh, radial intercalation. But the cells that are expressing histone H to B, so this in magenta, so these are the cells that are also are depleted of the LSR. So in these cells, we depleted LSR. So you see here that in contrast to the control situation, to the wild type multiseated cells, these multiseated cells in which we knock down LSR, they actually have a quite uh, challenge or it's, it's a challenge for them to actually insert and integrate in the epithelium. In fact, they actually fail to integrate. So they go up and down, up and down into, into, the, into the tissue and, and finally they kind of disappear deep into the epithelium. So they actually fail the radial integration, fail the integration process into the epithelium. So this is the majority of the, of the cells uh, they show this uh, phenotype. The rest of the cells, I think about 20% or so, they show something else. So here the colors are a little, colors are a little bit uh, different. So again, <clears throat> the wild type cells are shown here with these uh, arrows. So these cells are will expand apical domain and integrate in into the into the epithelium, whereas the cells in which we knock down LSR, these cells are actually expressed here GFP. So these cells, the green cells in here, are the cells in which LSR is knocked down. So what we can see here that these cells also initially have problems to radially intercalate. They go up and down, up and down several times. But uh, finally, they actually reach the vertices. They manage to reach the, the, the superficial layer. But then instead of expanding the apical domain, they actually stick there for quite some time. So they stick at the vertices and then they undergo cell death. Yeah. So that's quite a, a spectacular uh, explosion. So you can see here that you know, even though they manage to reach the superficial layer, they actually undergo cell death. 
So what is then happening? So when we look at the, at the comparison between control situation and the LSR knockdown, there's a lot of things that are different. So first of all, what we notice is that the, while in a control situation, we have very prominent actin in the, the cortical region, so in this leading edge of the cell, this is basically not the case in the LSR knockdown cells. So these cells basically are devoid of, of any actin in the, in, the, in the cortical region. And also, in contrast situation, we have very prominent philopodia. Yeah? So the philopodia kind of growing from the leading edge of the cell, whereas in the LSR morpholino situation, uh, the philopodia are not, pre not present at all. This is also quantified in here. So uh, if you look, if you, look uh, you know, at many of these pictures and, and quantifying the, the, the signal, the cortical signal in, in a contra situation versus the cortical signal in, in the LSR morpholino or, or, or looking at the uh, philopodia, uh, numbers. In, in both cases, this this is clear that the LSR uh, cells they basically don't they don't have any cortex, they don't have any any philopodia, and this is also the same when it when we look dynamically when you look in time. Uh, so this is not only specific to the you know this is not because of we select specific cell uh, uh, time uh, point, but it's actually consistent throughout uh, all the uh, all the time points we are looking at. All right, so let's recap what, what we were talking about until now. So first of all, we see that as multicellular cells radially intercalate, they're making philopodia, yeah? And they interact with the LSR at the superficial layer using this uh, direct interactions between LSR within the tip of the philopodia and LSR within the superficial layer. And then what I uh, told you that if we knock down LSR specifically in multicellular cells, then the cells fail to radially intercalate and they fail to integrate into the epithelium. Instead, they actually go down into the tissue. Still, the question is like, what's the function of this philopodia? What are these philopodia actually probing in the environment? And how is this information then transmitted back and, and, and integrated into the behavior of the cell? The partial answer to this question comes again from looking at the dynamics of these interactions between the philopodia and LSR. So what we notice is that as philopodia are directly binding the LSR cables at the vertices, they actually pull on these vertices. So this is very interesting because it could explain what's the function of this of this of, of this philopodia, why the philopodia are actually pulling at the at the at the vertices. So if this is not uh, not clear, let's have a look at this schematic. So if we now imagine the situation that we have two kind of overlying uh, things like one would be a soft or compliant element like a rubber ball and then the other one would be like a non-compliant element a very hard one and then we connect a rope to these two elements so this rope would be representing our lsr cable and then if we pull on these two elements if we pull on this rope we as humans will be able to determine okay this is the soft element and this is the hard or non-compliant element so now the question is, can cells do the same? Can cells, in a way, by pulling at the vertices, determine, okay, this is the, uh, let's say, soft vertex, and this is the hard vertex. Uh, and why is it actually important for the cell to know, okay, this is the, the hard, the soft vertex, and this is the hard vertex? What is the function of that? What's the, what's the meaning of this information for the cell? So to answer this question, we set up a minimal theoretical model of pulling force. So basically, we wanted to understand what's the function of the pulling force when it comes to the uh, sensing of the environment. So this model consists of uh, three parts. So in the part one, we basically um, determine the mechanics of the of the epithelium using classical vertex vertex based modeling. So in this um, in this type of modeling, we basically assume that the tissue or the epithelium is a kind of network of connected vertices. And each uh, vertex has certain uh, energy. And this energy is given by multiple parameters. So here is uh, cell stiffness, the preferred area. And an important parameter here is basically the tension of the junctions which are constituting the vertices. So now upon, um, so after kind of defining the mechanics of this epithelium, we go to the part two, which is basically application of the pulling force at each of the vertices of the epithelium. 
So because this is simulation, so now we're looking at the kind of site of the of the of the vertex. So we he, we see here the two junctions. So lambda one and lambda two. These are the line tensions that are building the the vertices. And we know, okay. And now we apply the pulling force. So pulling force F. So again, because this is a simulation, we know exactly the amount of pulling force, and we know exactly the uh, displacement of the vertex. So as a consequence of the pulling force, the vertex will get displaced. So now we know these two parameters. We know how much we pull at this vertex, and we know how much did this vertex display. So if you now calculate the ratio of the amount of pulling force and the displacement, this is something what we, at the end, what we get is something what we call vertex stiffness. OK, so just to be on the same page, what is this uh, vertex stiffness? OK, so vertex stiffness uh like in a simpler words you can you can think about it as a, as a, as a sum of the line tensions that constitute the vertex so for example if you have a vertex which is built by three cells so one two and three so basically we have three junctions which are pulling at the at the at the vertex and each junction has a center has a, a certain tension so here lambda one lambda, lambda two and lambda three you can think about vertex stiffness of to be proportional to the sum of this line tensions, so lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. Yeah. So now, if we now apply this pulling force in our simulation to to each of these vertices that are building the epithelium, this is what we get at the end. So what we see in here is the map of vertex stiffnesses. So you can see here that the vertex, that the stiffness of the vertices is very heterogeneous, meaning that some of the vertices are stiffer and some of the vertices are less stiff. Yeah. OK, so let me now move to the last part of the, of the model. So now we know exactly what is the stiffness of each of the vertices yeah, in the tissue. So now what we can do in our simulation, we can bring back our cells into the tissue and basically measure the prob probability of cells to insert into the epithelium. So again, by insertion, I mean, so if the cell will manage to open the apical domain, this is basically the successful event of intercalation. If the cell will fail to, to open the apical domain, this is basically the failure of radial intercalation, and the cell will, no in, will not integrate into the epithelium. So interestingly, there are two predictions from the model. So first of all, the model predicts that cells, so this radially intercalating multi-sated cell progenitures, will prefer to insert at the stiffer vertices and then the second prediction of the model is that the stiffer vertices are actually vertices which are built by four and higher number of cells. So for example, if you compare the probability of insertion between the lower fold vertex, so in that case built by three cells, to the prob probability of insertion of, uh, of a cell at the higher type of vertex, in that case four-way vertex, so built by, built by four cells, it is clear that cells will prefer to insert at this four-fold vertex or higher-fold vertex compared to the three-fold, so lower-fold vertex. So now, why so? So first of all, why the higher-fold vertex? Why the higher-fold vertex is actually stiffer compared to the uh, lower-fold vertex? Okay. So before I, I showed you this picture where we have this uh, three-fold vertex so again built by three cells. So again, we have these three junctions, one, two, three, and you know these guys represent pulling at the pulling at the at the vertex. In that case, the vertex stiffness of this threefold vertex is proportional to some of these line tensions, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. So now, if you imagine the situation where we have higher fold vertex, an example of this would be a fourfold vertex. So here we have one additional pulling junction. So this is represented by this lambda four. So again, because you have this additional pulling force, so additional uh, junction, then the stiffness of this vertex will be uh, higher. Yeah. So now the vertex of the, the stiffness of this vertex will be proportional to the to the sum of the line tensions one, two, three, four. So in that case, it's very simple. In that case, the fourfold vertex is obviously more stiffer, more stiff than the threefold vertex. But now 
why actually it is more beneficial or more optimal for the cell to insert the um, stiffer vertices or these higher fold vertices compared to the lower, less stiff vertices? So to answer this question, we actually have to understand the force balance which is happening at the apical domain. So as cells are expanding the apical domain, there are two forces that are kind of determining the dynamics of this process. So we have force here representing this kind of red arrows. So these are this uh, pulling forces. So this is this is the force that that is generated by the junctions, which are constituting the vertices. So again, these are the the, the forces that tends to expand the apical domain. So pulling forces. On the other hand, we have also forces that tends to shrink the apical domain. So this is represented by this uh, gamma uh, vectors. So this forces actually tends to shrink the apical domain. So in a way, we have two forces. One, the red one that pulls the apical domain and make it easier to expand the apical, do apical domain. And then this gamma forces, this is, this is the cortical tension of the, of, the, of, the, of the apical domain that tends to shrink the apical domain. So this works against the pulling force. So now to understand the relationship between these two forces, we can look at this so-called phase diagram. So now phase diagram represents the relationship between the two forces. On the x-axis, we have a line tension, so basically a pulling force that expands the apical domain. And on the y-axis, we have the compression force that tends to shrink the apical domain. OK, so now if we take certain uh, value of the line tension, so basically the force that tends to uh, shrink the apical domain. In that case, let's let's take it a 0.04, yeah? So you can see here that for this amount of the compression force, the four-fold vertex, so built by four cells, will open first, yeah? And only when we increase the pulling force uh, much higher, yeah, to this value in that case, almost 0.08, then only then the threefold vertex will open the apical domain. So in a way, if you have a vertex built by three cells, yeah, three junctions, you have to pull much stronger on the apical domain to be able to open the apical domain. If you have vertex which is built by higher number of junctions, you don't have to pull so much, just a little bit, and you still manage to open the apical domain. So again, this is the reason why cells prefer to insert at the higher fold vertices because it's just much easier to open the apical domain and integrate um, ultimately at the uh, at the superficial layer. And you can actually uh, look at this uh, force balance kind of from the different perspective. So now, for example, we can look at the uh, yeah how much for example how much we can decrease of the line tension, this compression force, until we see the expansion of the apical domain. So let's say if we take again the uh, four-fold vertex, so starting from this uh, position in here at the, at the very right, so you can see here that we have to, that if you have a four-fold vertex, uh, it will open first, yeah? But in case of the three-fold vertex, you have to keep on decreasing the amount of the compression force to be able to open the apical domain. Yeah, it's it's it, it's it kind of different way of, of looking at the same problem. So just to, to, to make it simpler again, if you have higher full vertex, these vertices will open easier because you have contribution of more junctions which are pulling of the apical domain. Okay, so so again, there are two major predictions of the of the model. So first prediction was that the cells will insert at the stiffer vertices and that the stiffer vertices are uh, the higher fold vertices. So then next, what we did, we wanted to validate model experimentally. So we have to look at multiple things in here. <clears throat> so first we have to validate, we have to basically measure the vertex stiffness. So compare the vertex stiffness between the higher fold vertices and lower fold vertices. So basically uh, to, to verify if this is really the case that the stiffness of the higher fold vertices is higher compared to the lower type of vertices. Then we have to quantify uh, the number and the type of the vertices we have present uh, throughout the process of radial intercalation. And finally, we have to determine where multi-stated cells actually integrate, in which type of vertices the cells actually integrate during, during the process of radial intercalation. 
All right, so let's start maybe uh, with the with the last part. So basically, we, want, we wanted to address the question, okay, in what type of vertices the cells will integrate? Is it really this higher fault uh, vertices uh, as predicted by the theoretical model? So to answer this question, we started doing this um, um, higher zoom uh, uh, movies. So here we're looking at the dynamics of, of myosin. So you can see here, that uh, as development progresses, we start seeing the insertion of the multi seated cells at the vertices. So then obviously we have to um, do uh, quite a lot of quantification, this type of movies. So for example, to be able to, to read the, or to infer the tension of the junctions, we have to segment the junctions. So this is done uh, semi-automatically. Uh, then we have to also determine the type of vertices. So we have to determine what kind of neighborhood we have uh, present in the tissue. So here you can see, as I played the movie, you can see if, uh, later on the cells start popping from the bottom and the vertices. Uh, and at the end, what we were able to do, first of all, to determine where the cells are inserted, what type of ver in which type of vertices they are inserted. And this is shown in here. So on this plot, on the x-axis, we have time. And this time is normalized to time point zero. So time point zero is the time when multi seated cell progenitors is just inserted into the epithelium. So this is, this is the time where they you know, insert into the insert into the veg, into the, in, into the vertex, and starts expanding the apical domain. And on the y-axis, we basically the, quantify the percentage of these insertions at which and at which vertex the cells are inserted. So what is interesting that as we kind of look in time, we see that indeed cells prefer to insert at the stiffer, at the higher fold vertices, so four and five wave vertices, and not so much at the three wave uh, vertices, so these lower fold vertices. When it comes to the six and seven wave vertices, so also higher type of vertices, this these numbers are also very low, and simply because this type of vertices are almost not present in the, the tissue. So cumulatively, what we see that is that cells indeed prefer to insert into this higher fold vertices, so built by um, four and higher number of cells. So about 57% of, of, of cases, the cells insert into the four-way vertices. About 32% they insert into the five-way vertices, and about 6.6% they insert into the into the lower fold uh, free fold vertices as predicted by the theoretical model. So when it comes to the uh, vertex stiffness, and this is again inferred from from the intensity measurements of, of myosin signal, it is also kind of clear that the when you compare in that case free fold vertex to to the four fold vertex, we see that throughout time throughout the throughout radial integration the fold four vertices are stiffer compared to the three fold vertices. And this is maybe not very surprising simply because four fold vertices, they have more junctions, yeah? And the tension of the junctions are actually quite uh, similar between uh, three fold and four fold vertices. So simply because you have more junctions then the overall uh, stiffness of the vertex will be higher. However, there was one interesting thing that still was kind of puzzling to us because Okay, this is correct. Uh, you know, as model predicted, we see that the cells insert into the higher fold vertices. As you can see in here, okay, we see the cells insert into four-way, five-way vertices. Yeah, there's not so much insertion into three-fold vertices. But before insertion, actually, there are no oh, higher fold vertices. Before radial intercalation, when you look at the topology of the tissue, geometry of the tissue, they are mostly three-fold vertices, which kind of poses the question, okay, how does it work? You know, how do you go from the topology of the tissue, which is dominated by the three-fold vertices, to the topology of the tissue, which is, which is dominated by the, you know, higher fold, so four and, and five and, and higher fold vertices, yeah? How does it really work? Well, uh, all right, so, and indeed, when you look at the at the at the dynamics of the of 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 the of this transition, for example, when you look, what is the percentage of the threefold vertices compared to the fourfold vertices? We see that as cells are radially intercalate, and again, 
Here on the x-axis, we have time. And again, it is normalized to time point zero. And again, time point zero is the time when the cells insert into the epithelium. We can see here that before this, this time, the tissue is dominated by the threefold vertices. So here represented in green. But as the number of the threefold vertices is decreasing, the number of the, in that case, four-way vertices, so built by four cells, is increasing and interestingly reaches the maximum at the time point zero. So basically at the time point where the cells radially intercalate. So what's happening in here? All right, so in order to generate this fourfold vertex, out of the threefold vertex, one thing has to happen. So actually what has to happen is that this junction here depicted in green that connects, in that case, two threefold vertices has to shrink. But now the question is like, who does this job? Is the shrinking of this junction uh, basically happening within the superficial layer? So is, so is in other words, like our goblet says in a way constricting this junction and making this higher fold vertices or alternatively it could be that the intercalating multi-seat itself somehow changes this junction or shrinks this junction and makes the fourfold vertex okay so to test this two possibilities to verify which is actually the which which is actually the the, the case we look at the instances where we actually see the shrinking of the junction and formation of the higher fold vertices out of the uh, threefold vertices. This is one example in here. So here we're going to look at, at the dynamics of these two junctions that are going to shrink. And this is the, we look in our signal of myosin specifically expressed in the, in the goblet cells. Yeah. And on the right hand side, we actually see the signal of a multi seated cell that are that that is approaching this this two shrinking junction so let me just play this movie okay so what we see in here is that these two junctions are shrinking and funny enough this multi seated cell is uh, basically underlying the shrinking junction yeah now if you look at the same movie from the orthogonal perspective which is shown in here here the colors are a little bit inverted so in green, we see the signal of myosin, and in magenta, we see the signal of the intercalating multi seated cell. We, we can actually see that these two the kind of high intensity dots, so these are the two vertices that are shrinking. So you can see here that the, as the, as the multi seated cell approaching from the bottom, the two vertices are actually coming together and the junction is shrinking. So let's have a look in a little bit more details what's happening in here. So now what we're going to look at is basically the length of this junction. So this junction is shrinking, is getting shorter and shorter. And this is represented, uh, quantified on this plot. So basically starting from the time point 22 or something, we see the length of this junction represented in this purple color, color is actually decreasing. Yeah. But now if you look at the intensity of myosin, so myosin here is a proxy of the, of the tension of the junction. We see here that as the junction is shrinking, the intensity of myosin is actually not really increasing until the very late stages. So as the junction is shrinking, intensity of myosin is not increasing. And typically, you would expect that the intensity of myosin will increase because in a classical kind of uh, you know, settings, this is actually myosin that is driven the compression of the junction. But this is not the case in here. And interestingly, if we now look at the intensity of actin, which is expressed in, in the multi seated cell, which is again approaching the shrinking junction, the situation is very interesting because as the junction is shrinking, and now let's look at this plot on the uh, right bottom side. So again, the junction is shrinking in purple. And again, time point 22, we start seeing the intensity of actin again, which basically tells us, tells us how close to the junction is multi seated cell progenitor. So this intensity is increasing. So as the multi seated cell is reaching the, the shrinking junction, uh, I forgot what I want to say. As the, yeah, so as, as the junction is shrinking, the multi seated cell is basically approaching the, 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 the junction. And interestingly, when you look what's happening at the time point 21, 22, 
yeah, here on this orthogonal section, we see that this is the first time point when when multi when the philopodia are basically grabbing more uh, both of the vertices. Yeah, so basically you can imagine the situation that as cell is approaching the the overlying junction, the philopodia are grabbing both of the vertices and bring these two vertices together and form the higher fold vertices. Yeah, so this is again schematically schematically represented in here. So what we see in here is that philopodia grab both of the vertices and as a consequence they pull off these vertices and because of this compression force which is generated as a consequence of pulling off the vertices they basically can compress junction and shrink the junction and generate higher fold vertex okay but then we want to understand is this compression force generated by the philopodia which are grabbing both of the vertices actually enough to shrink the junction so to answer this question we turn back into our uh, simulation so in here we already have simulated tissue and what we did in here we applied compression to the junctions and we ask okay what are the parameters that will actually determine the shrinking of the junction because you can imagine that the junction will shrink as a, as a, as a consequence of the compression force if the junction will be very short or if the tension of the junction will be very high, yeah? So this is actually what we ask in this simulation. So we ask, okay, we applied the compression force to the junctions and we wanted to see which junction will shrink and which will not shrink. So the results of the model of the simulation is following. So this is on the uh, top, um, kind of top right uh, panel in here. So now we're looking at the relationship between the tension so how contractile the junctions are and the length so how long the junctions are as a consequence of the of the compression force so what we see based on the simulation is that the collapsing junctions are actually the junctions which are very short so it doesn't matter if the junction has a high or low contractility what actually matters is the length of the junction so this is the the simulation the the prediction of the of the model and then we actually verified experimentally, basically doing pretty much the same. We're, we're inferring the tension of the, of the junction, looking at the intensity of myosin, again, specifically expressed in the superficial layer. And we also look at the length of these junctions. Yeah? And again, what was interesting is that we see experimentally very much the same as we see in a simulation. So basically, we see that the junctions that are shrinking are actually the junctions which are short. So it doesn't really matter if they are contractile or not they just have to be short and if the junction is short they're very likely to be compressed by the philopodia which are generated by the multi seated cells but then the question is okay but what does it mean short is it you know how short is short so to answer this question we basically find the instances the events where we see the compression and we basically look what's happening before yeah what is the length of the junctions that got or shrank as a consequence of, of, of this compression forces exerted by the philopodia. So if you do it for, for many cells, it is clear, clear that actually the, the, the junctions which are shorter than 10 micrometers, they are, actually, they are going to be compressed by the philopodia. And as a consequence, this junction will kind of contribute to the, contribute to the formation of the higher fold vertices. And this 10 micrometers is actually quite an interesting number because 10 micrometers is pretty much the you know span span of the of the arm of the you know very left and very right philopodia. So like basically this is as much as the as the single multi seated cell can reach to the left and the right uh, vertex in order to grab both of the vertices and and, and compress the junctions <clears throat> to form this higher fold uh, vertex. But so if you're now talking about um, pulling or, or, or forces, then the question is actually, what generates this pulling force? How the philopodia actually generate these pulling forces that at the end, you know, shrink the, the junctions? So when we talk about force, basically the, the obvious candidate is myosin. So then we wanted to ask, then we asked the question, okay, where is actually myosin in our situation, in our system? So then again, we express SF9, which is the, 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 the probe of, of myosin or nanobody for, 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 for myosin. Uh, and what we see in here is that 
So this signal of myosin is actually expressed here in, in magenta color, and you can see that it's expressed, you know, specifically, it's expressed, of course, in, in the superficial layer, but also we see the signal in the intercalating multisated cell. So you can see here that as multisated multi cell intercalates, so here visualized by actin again in green, there is also some sort of a signal of the myosin. And maybe to make it easier for you, we binarize the myosin signal. So again, you can see the signal of myosin in the superficial layer, but we can also see the signal of myosin, you know, at the at the leading edge of the cell. So now to make it maybe even uh, simpler or make it more clear where the myosin signal is when it comes to the multisated cell, let's have a look at this kind of um, static images. So again. Here we depicted the, the, the position of the leading, leading edge of the cell of radially intercalating multisated cell with this dotted line. You can see here the, this very uh, nice prominent philopodia growing from the leading edge of the cell. And as depicted here by this arrowhead, we see the signal of the myosin, yeah, kind of at the base of the philopodium. And this is maybe easier to see if you look at the separate channels. So here in this fire like a channel, you can see the signal of the of the myosin again at, at the base of the philopodium. So this is very interesting. This is also consistent with the with the previous um, studies showing that indeed at the base of the philopodium there is activity of myosin, and this activity of myosin is important to be able to retract the philopo the philopodium back into the into the into the leading edge of the cell. So now, okay, if we're saying that philopodia basically grabbing the vertices and they apply the pulling force generated by myosin motors at the base of the philopodium, what is then going to happen if we perturb activity of myosin specifically in multisated cells yeah, during the radial intercalation? So this is what we did in here. So here we express constitutively, constitutively active myosin light change phosphatase. So by doing so, we basically make the myosin motors inactive. Yeah. So we see here in green, this is the overlying kind of epithelium. Yeah. In, in in magenta, we actually see the signal of the nucleus. So we know that in this particular cell, we express this myosin line change phosphatase. So we know in the, that in this particular cell, the activity of myosin is, is impaired. So what is happening in here is that this cell still, you know, radially, like radially migrate. You know, they still actually make philopodia, but they never manage to grab both of the vertices and bring these vertices uh, together to form these higher fold vertices. Yeah. So basically, they are unable to generate pulling force, which would be required to bring the junction or shrink the junction and generate these higher fold vertices. And this is uh, quantified in here. So if you remember, in a control situation, the radially intercalating cells, they use philopodia, they grab these two vertices and they shrink the junction. So you can see here very nicely, these overlying junctions are shrinking in the control situation. But in case of the, of the myosin impairment, the junctions are never shrinking. Yet the junctions are basically never uh, change the length. All right. So let me just summarize what I was uh, talking today. So today I was talking about generally the process of environment probing by the migrating cells. So what we figure it out that in case of the migrating multisated cell progenitors, we saw that the cells are actively probing the environment using philopodia. And they use this philopodia to probe vertices. So what they basically do, they grab the vertices, they grab this LSR cable at the vertices, they pull on these vertices, and by doing so, they can read the vertex stiffness. And if the vertex stiffness is you know, high enough, they will integrate into this vertex, expand the apical domain, and everything will be fine. But what we also found out that is actually very cool is that these radially intercalating cells, they can also modify the overlying tissue. Yeah. So they can, if they, if they, can't find what they're kind of looking for. If the environment is, let's say, suboptimal, they can remodel the environment, they can grab the vertices, they can bring vertices together, and by doing so, they will generate stiffer, 
higher fold vertex, which would be much more optimal for these cells to intercalate. So with that, I would like to thank my entire lab. Uh, it was uh, great, uh, you know, to, it's fantastic to work with this uh, young, very talented people. So this work, this particular project uh, has been driven by the PhD student Guillermo Ventura. And I would like to also thank collaborators, uh, Amin and, and, and Abu, who actually help us a lot with the theoretical model. And uh, also, if somebody is interested, we are looking for the PhD and, and postdoc. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take uh, questions.